All right. Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. While touring his kingdom at the end of the 8th century, Charlemagne found himself in the town of Apt, in the south of France, during the dedication of the church. He had one of his notaries describe the remarkable events of that day in a letter, which still exists, and the letter was addressed to Pope St. Leo III. The church had been rebuilt on the site of the ancient chapel. Besides Charlemagne and his party, there was a huge crowd of noblemen, clergy, and people that were present for the rededication of the church, including a 14-year-old boy named John. John was the son of a local nobleman. John had been deaf, dumb, and blind from birth. During the ceremonies, John uh, got up, walked up to the altar steps, and began banging his walking stick over and over on one of the steps of the altar, kept making signs they should dig there. Obviously, whacking uh, an altar step with a walking stick caused quite a disturbance during such a solemn occasion, but John could hardly be restrained. Charlemagne was amazed and impressed by the action of the young, deaf, dumb, and blind man, so much so that after Mass, he commanded that the step that John had been smacking on be lifted up to see what might be beneath it. So the workmen lifted up that altar step as well as the huge stones which lay underneath it. To everyone's amazement, as the huge stones were removed, a door was revealed. When they opened the door, there was an ancient stairway there. And that stairway went down to the crypt of the ancient church in which Mass had been sent centuries before during the Roman persecutions. When the door was opened, John, who by this time was hanging on to Charlemagne's hand, pulled Charlemagne forward, almost as if he could see where he was going, in spite of the fact that he's blind. Charlemagne gave orders that the crowd should be held back and allowed John to lead him down the stairs. John led Charlemagne down into the crypt, up to one of the walls, and began smacking that over and over. So Charlemagne had the workmen break down that section of the wall. When they removed that section of the wall, they uncovered a long and narrow passageway hidden behind it. John led Charlemagne and his companions down that passageway. At the end of that corridor, they entered into another crypt, where to the astonishment of all present, there was a walled-in recess with a vigil lamp burning in front of it. There was a burning vigil lamp when they got there. So imagine their astonishment. You have this deaf, dumb, and blind boy is leading a group which has pulled up an altar step only to uncover an ancient door. Behind the door is a staircase which leads down into the crypt that was used for mass, an underground crypt from the time of the Roman persecutions. And then the same deaf, dumb, and blind boy has led them to uncover another passageway hidden behind the walls of that underground church and led them to the end of that hidden passageway into a yet another crypt that had literally been hidden for centuries. And in that crypt, in front of a wall in a recess, is a burning vigil lamp, which fills the whole crypt with an unearthly, heavenly glow. They're standing there, pondering this incredible sight, when suddenly the lamp went out. And at that very moment, John, the boy who had been uh, beating on the steps of the stair at the altar during the consecration of the church, the boy had been deaf, dumb, and blind from birth. At that very moment, John could suddenly hear, speak, and see, and he cried out his very first words. It is she. It is she. Charlemagne didn't know what John meant, but he repeated the words anyway. The people along the corridor and the crowds in the church began repeating the words as well, and they knelt down. Why? What was going on? Everyone was saying it is she, but who is she? The local townspeople knew who she was. They knew that she was somewhere under that church. They knew that after the Roman persecutions, when the barbarians had begun to swarm over the region, she had been carefully hidden for safekeeping for many, many centuries. But until then, they didn't know where she was. Okay, fine, but who is she? Charlemagne had the workmen carefully open the walled-in recess. 
As soon as they began opening it, a wonderful sweet smell like oriental incense filled the air. And then they could see there in the recess a casket made of cypress wood. Inside the casket, wrapped in precious oriental cloth were relics. Enclosed was an inscription. It answers the question, who is she? The inscription read, here lies the body of Saint Anne, the mother of the glorious Virgin Mary. The relics of Saint Anne have been miraculously rediscovered. The relics of the mother of the mother of God, the relics of the woman in whose womb the Blessed Virgin Mary was immaculate conceived, the relics of our Lord's grandmother have been miraculously rediscovered. Saint Anne, whose feast day we celebrated this past Wednesday. Charlemagne, with all those present, spent a long time in prayer, and then venerated the holy relics which had been so marvelously discovered. For three days the people of Abt, who were overwhelmed by these marvelous events and the great mercies that God had shown them, kept a reverential silence, speaking only when necessary, and then only in whispers. Would that we could do that in front of our Lord, the most blessed sacrament of the altar in our day and age. Charlemagne had an exact narrative of the discovery drawn up by one of his notaries and a copy sent to the Pope with the royal letter. This letter and the Pope's answer are still in existence. Okay, Father, but there's a big part of the story missing here. How did St. Anne's relics end up in southern France in the first place? After all, it's not exactly a hop, skip, and a jump from the Holy Land to the south of France. How did St. Anne's relics end up in the, in the south of France? They were shipped there. Now that's another story that we know from both tradition as well as divine liturgy. A brief version of the story is found in the Roman martyrology and also scattered through, or found in the Roman breviary and it's also scattered through the Roman martyrology. Here's what happened. After the ascension of our Lord and the martyrdom of Saint Stephen, around the year 47, during the persecution of the Catholics by the Jews, the Jews captured a group of Catholics, stuffed them into a boat without sails or a rudder, and pushed it out to sea, intending, of course, that everyone on board would die. But instead, this crippled death boat miraculously landed with everyone safe on board, all the way on the other end of the Mediterranean Sea at Marseille which is now the south of France, everyone healthy and safe, on board of the relics of St. Anne. That's how the relics got to southern France. And as you can easily imagine, the arrival safely of a rudderless, sailless, oarless ship from the far stretches of the Mediterranean with a cargo of healthy people on board made quite an impression on the local population of pagans. As a breviary, for the reading the breviary for yesterday states, quote, by means of this miracle and the preaching of the Catholics, the people of Marseille and the surrounding regions were converted to Christ." Close quote. Okay, so besides the relics of St. Anne, who else was on this ship? Well, on the death boat was St. Maximus. St. Maximinus. St. Maximinus was one of the 72 disciples of our Lord. Remember after our Lord chose the 12 apostles, he chose uh, 72 disciples and sent them before him two by two. Anyway, St. Maximinus was a bishop, and he's one of the 72 disciples, and he was stuffed on that boat. He wound up being the first bishop who was now by France. Along with was St. Sidonius. St. Sidonius was the man born blind from birth. That's the guy you can read about in the ninth chapter of St. John's Gospel, when our Lord uh, gave him sight by making mud from spit and anointing his eyes. After the ascension, St. Sidonius was baptized by the apostles, and he was a companion of St. Maximinus. St. Sidonius was coadjutor bishop of St. Maximinus and I, and wound up being buried next to him there in the south of France. Well, who else was on the boat? Another saint whose feast we celebrated a week ago Saturday, on the 22nd of July. A notorious sinner who had seven devils driven out of her, who had stayed faithful at the foot of the cross during the Lord's passion and death, and was the first public witness of our Lord's resurrection, St. Mary Magdalene. 
St. Peter had trusted St. Mary Magdalene to the care of St. Maximinus, and so she wound up on board that, that ship as well. The Fathers state that after reaching southern France, um, Marseille and the surrounding whole province was converted from paganism by the force principally of St. Mary Magdalene's preaching. She spent the rest of her life as a contemplative. She lived by 30 years in a cave of the mountains, uh, praying doing penance. It's, it's up by Avignon. Like St. Catherine of Siena and St. Gemma Gogani, her only food was the most blessed sacrament, which was brought to her by the holy angels. Just before she died, the holy angels brought her to St. Maximinus Chapel, because God takes care of his friends. And uh, St. Maximinus gave her the last rites and buried her there. In the year 710, when the Muslims invaded, her relics were hidden by the monks, and they remained hidden until their rediscovery in the 13th century. And that was confirmed to be the authentic relics of St. Mary Magdalene by Pope Boniface VIII. Who else is on the death boat? St. Mary Magdalene's brother, St. Lazarus. St. Lazarus became the first bishop of Marseille, and after the conversion of people from paganism, he ruled the church in peace. His feast day, the day of his death, is December 17th. As the Roman Martyrology says for that day, now the Roman Martyrology is a liturgical book that we read that contains the list of the martyrs and saints for each day of the year. On December 17th, the Roman Martyrology says, quote, at Marseille in France, blessed Lazarus, bishop, brother of saints Mary Magdalene and Martha, of whom we read in the gospel, the Lord called him his friend and raised him from the dead. Close quote, the Roman Martyrology. Who else was on the death boat? Another saint whose feast we celebrated yesterday, the sister of St. Lazarus and St. Mary Magdalene, the Holy Virgin, St. Martha. After getting permission from St. Maximinus, St. Martha devoted herself to a life of fasting and prayer. Eventually, she gathered a large congregation of other women around her to sing the Psalms and fast and pray in what we would now call a convent. And her relics are found in Tarascon in southern France. So today we've learned a little bit more about Martha, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus, about how God brought the true faith and the relics of St. Anne to southern France, and about how God brought about the rediscovery of the relics of his grandmother. It's a perfect example of how God uses the weak things of the world to confound the strong. God wanted to rekindle the devotion to his grandmother by uncovering her relics. And look how he did it. Right in there in the presence of the Holy Roman Emperor, the militarily most powerful man in the world, in the presence of all those great warriors, those noblemen, all those bishops and priests and religious and faithful men and women. And right there in the face of all those high and mighty ones, who did God choose? A deaf, dumb, and blind 14-year-old boy. He can use us, too, to do something good if we just let him. That's how God works. Anyway, since that day some 1,200 years ago that St. Anne got her grandson to give the gift of sight and hearing speech to John, she hasn't let up for a minute in her city for those who invoke her. When the very first chapel of St. Anne de Beaupre was being built in Quebec in 1658, Louis Guimont, he was a terrible crippled man, he's very crippled, uh, wanted to express his devotion to St. Anne, and so he carried three small stones up to place in the foundation. And right before everybody's eyes, he's instantly miraculously cured. Now there's a great basilica on that site. Inside are a number of the miracle-working relics of St. Anne, including her forearm. Piles of crutches and bandages have been left at the modern basilica by pilgrims who have been cured through the incredible, uh, powerful incession of the Mother of Our Lady and the Grandmother of Our Lord. I personally uh, know a woman who couldn't have any more children, made a pilgrimage to St. Anne de Beaupre, praying for a miracle, and now through the intercession of good St. Anne, there's three more uh, people in the world, two boys and my cousin Anne. St. Anne is powerful. Those great saints and doctors of the church, St. Augustine, St. John Damascene, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Teresa Avila all had great devotion to St. Anne. St. Teresa Avila used to say, quote, we know and are convinced that our good mother, St. Anne, helps us in all needs, dangers, and tribulations, close quote. Among other things, St. Anne is a patroness of the childless, the help of the pregnant, protectress of widows, mother of the poor, and she's the patroness of laborers. Our Lady once said about good St. Anne, those who honor St. Anne will obtain great aid in every need, a 
especially at the hour of death. So we should turn to St. Anne and beg her to help us in our every need. Is our Lord going to turn down his grandma? Is our lady going to turn down her mom? The pile of crutches give the answer. We'll close with the words of Holy Abbot, who had a great devotion to St. Anne. Quote, To St. Anne, God has given the power to aid in every necessity, because Jesus, her divine grandchild according to the flesh, will refuse her no petition, and Mary, her glorious daughter, supports her every request. Those who venerate good St. Anne shall want for nothing, either in this life or the next. Believe me, if you love and venerate this saint, you will experience how highly God esteems her. He grants all she has. It would be impossible to enumerate the many graces she obtains daily for her servants. Close quote. To St. Anne, God has given the power to aid in every necessity, because Jesus will refuse her no petition, and Mary supports her every request. Those who venerate good St. Anne shall want for nothing, either in this life or in the next. If you love and venerate this saint, you'll experience how highly God esteems her. Good St. Anne, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.